Hello everyone, so today's lesson is going to be regarding chapter 5, which is all about stereochemistry. So stereochemistry basically refers to the three-dimensional structure of organic molecules. So you already learned in general chemistry and in the previous chapters that structure basically determines a molecule's physical and chemical properties. So even a small minor differences in the three-dimensional structure can actually make a huge difference in the molecule's physical and chemical properties. So by simply looking at a molecule's stereochemistry or three-dimensional structure tells us a lot about that molecule. It tells us a lot about its physical properties and chemical properties like boiling point, melting point, polarity, solubility, different intermolecular forces that are present between the molecules, the reactivity and stability. So when you look at these carbohydrates, for example, we have starch and cellulose. They contain the same exact repeating unit or monomer. They contain glucose. Yet they have very different physical and chemical properties. And the reason behind that is because of their stereochemistry. Their stereochemistry is different. So here's the stereochemistry of starch and cellulose. On the left here, we have the three-dimensional structure of cellulose. And on the right, we have the three-dimensional structure of starch. So when you analyze the three-dimensional structures of the two carbohydrates here, you can see that both of them contain the same exact repeating units. You have two glucose rings that are bonded or connected by an oxygen atom. And here on the right for starch, the same thing. We have two glucose rings that are connected to an oxygen atom. But when you analyze this, uh, the way the glucose rings are bonded to the oxygen atom, you can see that they're different for cellulose and starch. In cellulose, the oxygen atom joins the two glucose rings using equatorial bonds. But in starch you can see that one of them is in axial position and the other one is in equatorial position so this minor difference in their three-dimensional structure or stereochemistry makes a huge difference in their physical and chemical properties we can digest and metabolize starch but not cellulose so here's the three-dimensional structure of starch and cellulose. So starch and cellulose are actually isomers, which means that they have the same exact chemical formula, but different in three-dimensional structure. So when you look at starch, again, uh, the oxygen that connects the two glucose rings contain uh, a, an axial bond and an equatorial bond. And so it forces starch to have this helix um, structure. In cellulose, the oxygen atom contains uh, two equatorial bonds, so it forces cellulose to have this stacked arrangement. So you have a sheet of cellu cellulose on top of another. And so when you put this in water, it's actually a lot more difficult for water to access these oxygen atoms for hydrogen bonding. And so cellulose is less soluble in water than starch because when you look at the three-dimensional structure of starch these oxygen atoms are freely accessible to water and so they can form hydrogen bonding and so starch is more soluble than cellulose in one of the previous chapters you learned about isomers that isomers are molecules with the same exact molecular formula but entirely different compounds because they have different physical and chemical properties and there are two different types of isomers there is constitutional isomers and stereoisomers constitutional isomers are also known as structural isomers and they can have different names different IUPAC names they can have same or different functional groups they can have different chemical and physical properties Examples of constitutional or structural isomers are butane and isobutane. They have the same exact chemical formula, which is C4H10. And yet they're completely different compounds because they have completely different chemical structures. 
and so they have different physical and chemical properties. Stereoisomers, on the other hand, are molecules that differ only in the way the atoms are oriented in space. So that means that all the atoms are connected in the same exact way except in the way they're oriented in space. So one of the examples that we looked at in the previous chapter is the cis and trans isomers. Those are stereoisomers. So in the cis isomer, you have two of the bonds that are on the same side of the ring. Whereas in the trans isomer, one of the bonds is on one is on the other side of the ring. All right, and so stereoisomers differ in their configuration, meaning in their three-dimensional arrangement. And so because of that, they have identical IUPAC names, except we use prefixes like cis or trans. And you'll learn later on that there are other prefixes out there that we use to identify or to um, differentiate the two stereoisomers. And they can have the same functional groups. They can have the same uh, hydroxy group, for example, connected to the same atom. You can have the same carbonyl group in the same position, except one of the bonds or one of the atoms will be oriented in space differently in the two isomers. So here we have two pairs of isomers. We have the first pair here and then the second pair. Here's a pair of constitutional isomers, also known as structural isomers. We have 2-methylpentane and 3-methylpentane. So you can see that they have the same exact chemical formula, C6H14. And the only difference here is in their chemical structure. In 2-methylpentane, the methyl group is connected to the second carbon. In 3-methylpentane, the methyl group is attached to the third carbon. And so because of this, these two um, compounds are completely different with different physical and chemical properties. The second pair here is a pair of stereoisomers. We have cis and trans. And so you can see that um, they also contain or they also have the same chemical formulas, but the way the methyl groups are oriented in space is different. In the cis isomer, the two methyl groups are on the same side of the ring, but in the trans isomer, they are on the opposite side of the ring. So here's a practice problem. Classify each pair of compounds as either constitutional isomers or stereoisomers. All right, so let's take a look at the first one here. So you can see that um, we have this longest chain right here, one, two, three, four, and five. And on the other side, we also have this longest chain right here, one, two, three, four, and five. And so you can see that the methyl groups are connected to uh, different carbons, right? So you have one, two, three, and four. And so on this molecule right here, you have the methyl groups that are on the two and the fourth carbon, second and the fourth carbon. Over here, you have the methyl groups on the second and third carbon. And so in that case, these two are constitutional isomers. All right, and uh, for the second one here, we have one, two, three carbon atoms, one, two, three carbon atoms, and then connected to an oxygen. So you can see that they look completely different, and so th these two are constitutional isomers. And for part C here, we have uh, similar looking structures. The only difference here is the orientation of the methyl groups, right? So these two methyl groups are on the same same side of the ring, whereas over here they are on the opposite sides of the ring, and so they are stereoisomers. And the last one here, you can see that the one of the methyl groups is connected to a different carbon, and so obviously um, this pair is a pair of constitutional isomers. So we know that everything has a mirror image. Everything that's visible has a reflection, a mirror image. Mirror images may or may not be superimposable. 
What does that mean exactly? To superimpose means to align all parts of the two objects. Look at your hands, for example. Your right hand is a reflection, a mirror image of your left hand. But when you put your left hand on top of your right hand, all the parts don't line up. Your fingers don't line up. The thumbs, the four fingers, I guess except for the middle fingers. I guess they're special. But the point here is that there's a lot of molecules like that, like your hands. They are mirror images, but not superimposable, right? They don't line up. And so because they're non-superimposable, it makes those mirror images two completely different molecules. And in stereochemistry, there's a term for that. They're called chiral molecules. And chiral molecules are special. Okay, there's something special about them. And we're going to learn all of that in this chapter. And so a molecule or object that is not superimposable on its mirror image is said to be chiral. Again, an example are your hands. Your right hand and your left hand are non-superimposable chiral objects. So mirror images that are superimposable are said to be achiral. So you can have achiral objects and achiral molecules. A pair of socks, for example. One sock is a mirror image of the other one, right? And so when you superimpose them, you can see that they both line up perfectly. So this is known as superimposable achiral object. You can put a right sock on a left foot. You can put a left sock on a right foot. They are exactly identical because they are superimposable mirror images. So here's a few examples of achiral molecules, molecules that have superimposable mirror images. Look at water, for, for example. You can see that when you try to su superimpose water with its mirror image, you can see that the bonds and the atoms are perfectly aligned. And so water is considered an achiral molecule. Here's another example. We have bromochloromethane, CH2BrCl. When you look at its mirror image and you, you rotate the molecule to align the bonds, you can see that the bonds and atoms, again, are perfectly aligned. And so this molecule is considered an achiral molecule. And here's an example of a chiral molecule. So here we have a bromochlorofluoromethane, or CHBrClF. So you can see that A and B are mirror images, and these mirror images are non-superimposable. So that means that no matter how you rotate these molecules, two of the four atoms will never line up. And so because the two molecules are chiral molecules, they are completely different compounds with different properties. So A and B here are considered stereoisomers, and there's actually several different types of stereoisomers. You just learned in the previous chapter that there's cis and trans stereoisomers. A and B here are specifically enantiomers, and by definition, enantiomers are uh, stereoisomers that are chiral molecules. They are uh, non-superimposable mirror images. So a carbon atom with four different groups, such as this one, so this carbon right here has four atoms bonded to it, is a tetrahedral stereogenic center. So that means that this carbon atom right here is a stereogenic carbon. Same thing with this carbon right here, it's mirror image. And so you'll learn later on that um, a lot of chiral molecules with one, or a lot of molecules with one stereogenic center will always be chiral, okay? And so um, enantiomers, for example, a pair of enantiomers will have one stereogenic center. And here's a little bit about stereogenic centers. In general, a molecule with no stereogenic center will not be chiral. But if you have one stereogenic center, a molecule will always be chiral. And the example that we looked at in the previous slide is a perfect example of a chiral molecule. It has one stereogenic center. The carbon's connected to four different groups, four different atoms. And so that carbon is considered a stereogenic carbon. And therefore, that molecule is chiral. 
But if you have two or more stereogenic centers, a molecule may or may not be chiral. And so you have to look at other factors. And we'll take a look at a few examples uh, later on in this lecture. So here's a practice problem. Draw the mirror image of each compound and then label each molecule as chiral or achiral. So let's take a look at the first one here labeled A. So I'm going to draw its mirror image. So here's a mirror. Here's the carbon. Here's the chlorine and the bond. And here's bromine right here and CH3. So this is the mirror image of this compound. And so now I have to identify whether it's going to be a chiral molecule or an achiral molecule based on their superimposability. So if this molecule is superimposable with its mirror image, then I know that it's going to be an achiral molecule. Otherwise, it's going to be a chiral molecule. So if you look at this methyl group right here and rotate it in this direction, so this is going to be counterclockwise direction, then this methyl group is going to be on the left-hand side of the bromine atom. And then this other methyl group will go up. And then this chlorine atom will remain at the back of this molecule. And so now we have the methyl group on the left-hand side of the bromine atom. The other methyl group is going to be up top. And then the chlorine remains at the back. And so molecule A is an achiral molecule. because they are superimposable mirror images. Now, another way to determine chirality is to look at a stereogenic carbon or a stereogenic center. If you see one stereogenic center, then you know that the molecule is chiral. Otherwise, it's going to be achiral. So this carbon right here is not a stereogenic carbon, and so it's going to be an achiral molecule. The reason why it's not a stereogenic carbon is because it contains two of the same groups here. It contains two methyl groups. If this was a hydrogen instead, then this carbon is going to be a, a stereogenic carbon. And that would make this molecule with a hydrogen here chiral. Right, and for the second molecule here labeled B, I'm going to draw its mirror image. So I have a carbon here, a bromine here, a hydrogen, chlorine, and a methyl group. So here you can see that this carbon atom right here is a stereogenic carbon because this carbon is connected to one, two, three, four different groups. And so we have a stereogenic center or a stereogenic carbon and therefore molecule B is chiral. For the third molecule here, this is kind of obvious. This is going to be an achiral molecule because when you draw its, uh, its um, mirror image, it basically looks exactly like this. And so this is going to be an achiral molecule. And for the fourth one here, I'm going to draw its mirror image over here. So we have we have a fluorine atom. A bromine atom here and then a carbon bonded to a bromine bonded to a fluorine and then bonded to a hydrogen here and then carbon and then CH3 all right so basically when you rotate this molecule in this direction right here. So when you rotate this molecule in this direction, you can see that uh, the two molecules will not be superimposable, right? They're not going to be superimposable mirror images. And, and so this is going to be an achiral, or it's going to be a chiral molecule. All right, and you can kind of see 
uh, its chirality again just by looking at this carbon atom right here the center this is a stereogenic center because this carbon is connected to four different groups one two three and four so four different groups we have a chiral center and it's going to be a chiral uh, molecule so another way to determine whether a molecule is going to be chiral or achiral is to look at its plane of symmetry so plane of symmetry is a mirror plane an internal mirror plane that cuts the molecule in half so that one half of the molecule is a reflection of the other half so achiral molecules usually contain an internal plane of symmetry but those chiral molecules don't so an example two examples are shown here so we have uh, bromochloromethane again CH2BrCl and so when you draw this plane of symmetry within the molecule you can see that the left half is similar to the right half but in the uh, bromochlorofluoromethane you can see that there's no plane of symmetry anywhere in the molecule and so because of that this is considered a chiral molecule so here's a practice problem draw in a plane of symmetry if any for each molecule and then label each molecule as either chiral or achiral so when you look at the first molecule here you can uh, draw an internal plane let me use a different color here that basically connects chlorine and bromine like that and so one of the methyl group will be on one side of the plane and then the other methyl group is going to be on the other side of the plane so you can see that one side of the plane looks exactly the same as the other side of the plane and so this is going to be an achiral molecule and for the second molecule here you can see that again we have a stereogenic carbon this carbon is stereogenic because of the fact that it's connected to four different groups here and so there's this is not going to have any internal um, plane of symmetry and so this is going to be a chiral molecule and this third molecule here is a dimethyl ether and you can see that when you draw a mirror here a plane of symmetry you can see that the left side looks just like the right hand side and so this is going to be an achiral molecule and the last molecule here you can see that this carbon again is a stereogenic carbon because it's connected to one two three four different groups and so that you're not going to observe any plane of symmetry anywhere in this molecule so this is chiral molecule And here's another practice problem. Draw in a plane of symmetry for each molecule. So when you look at this first one right here, you can immediately uh, draw a plane of symmetry that basically bisects this angle right here. And so we can just cut this right here, and that's your plane of symmetry. So you know that this is going to be an achiral molecule. And then the second molecule here is sort of similar to this. You can again bisect this angle here and there you go the left hand is the same as the left uh, the right side and for the third molecule here you can draw a plane of symmetry right over here and that's it so the left hand side so you can't really see it from this angle but if you turn this about 45 degree angle then you'll see that uh, the left hand side will be uh, similar to the right hand side and the last one here um, this one is also simple all you have to do is uh, draw a vertical line here as the mirror and the left hand side looks exactly like the right hand side so here's the summary regarding chirality that you should remember so we know that everything has a mirror image and the mirror images can be either superimposable or non superimposable if the mirror images are superimposable then we know that the molecule is an achiral molecule however if the mirror images are non superimposable then we know that the molecules are chiral molecules 
The terms stereogenic center and chiral molecule are related but different. A stereogenic center can be used to describe a carbon that's connected to four different groups. And an achiral molecule can contain multiple stereogenic centers. And that's why you can't really uh, use a stereogenic and chiral molecule interchangeably. You can describe a carbon as a chiral carbon. And you can also describe that as a stereogenic carbon. That's fine. A chiral molecule must have one or more stereogenic centers. So we mentioned earlier that chiral molecules have at least one stereogenic centers. To locate a stereogenic center, examine each tetrahedral carbon atom in a molecule and look at the four groups, not the four atoms bonded to it. Always omit from consideration all carbon atoms that cannot be tetrahedral stereogenic centers. And these include CH2 and CH3 groups, any sp or sp2 hybridized carbon. And so when you look at this one example right here, we know that this carbon is a stereogenic carbon, or that this carbon is a stereogenic center because it contains four different groups. On this example right here, this, is, this carbon is also a stereogenic carbon because it contains four different groups, right? Although this right here is a carbon atom. This one right here is also a carbon atom. However, these are two different groups because you have a carbon connected to CH3, whereas this carbon is connected to CH2CH3. And so these groups of atoms right here are two different groups of atoms. And so 3-bromohexane is considered a chiral molecule because it contains a stereogenic carbon or a chiral carbon. And one other thing that you should always remember whenever you're trying to determine whether a carbon is a stereogenic center is um, the fact that the carbon has to be a tetrahedral carbon. And so if you have a carbon that's a, uh, that contains a double bond, then that can't be a stereogenic center. And so you have to keep in mind that the carbon has to be a tetrahedral sp3 hybridized carbon. Some larger organic molecules can have two, three, or even hundreds of stereogenic centers. When you look at these three examples right here, we have propoxyphene, ephedrine, and fructose. You can see based on their structure that they contain at least two stereogenic centers. Just look at propoxyphene. This carbon right here is a stereogenic center. It's a stereogenic chiral carbon because it's connected to four different groups. So again, this carbon is connected to an oxygen, a benzyl group or a phenyl group, a carbon that's bonded to a phenyl group, and then another carbon that's connected to other atoms. And so that makes this carbon a stereogenic center. Let's take a look at um, this carbon right here. It's bonded to a hydroxy group, bonded to a carbonyl group, bonded to a hydrogen, so this actually has a hydrogen, and it's also bonded to uh, a carbon connected to a hydroxy group. And so that makes this carbon uh, a chiral center as well, a chiral carbon. Here's another example. Locate the stereogenic centers in each drug. So here we have an albuterol and chloramphenicol. So remember that a stereogenic center can't be an sp or sp2 hybridized carbon, or you can't have two groups that are the same okay so this carbon right here can't be a stereogenic center and none of these carbons in the ring can be a stereogenic center because they are sp2 hybridized um, this carbon right here is a chiral center it's a stereogenic center because so i'm just going to circle this real quick because it's bonded to a hydroxy group a carbon or a, a phenyl group right here a ring it's also bonded to a hydrogen and then bonded to a carbon that's bonded to a nitrogen. And so these are four different groups of, of atoms or four different groups. So albuterol is a chiral molecule. What about this second one right here, chloramphenicol? So you can see that um, this carbon right here is bonded to hydroxy and it's also bonded to a ring structure. There's actually a hydrogen over here as well, and then it's bonded to this entire thing over here. So you can see that 
this carbon contains four different groups. And so this is considered a chiral carbon or a stereogenic center. Now, when you look at this carbon that's that's it's bonded with, you can see that this is also a stereogenic center because it's connected to a carbon bonded to a hydroxy, a carbon that's bonded to this entire group of atoms here, and then there's also a hydrogen here, and it's bonded to a nitrogen. And so those are four different groups, and so this is also considered a stereogenic center or a chiral center. And here's another example. Locate the four stereogenic centers in Alskirin. So let's take a look. So we're going to try to analyze every single carbon here. Remember that a stereogenic carbon has to be um, a tetrahedral sp3 hybridized carbon. So the first carbon here is not sp3 hybridized because it contains a double bond. This carbon right here is not a stereogenic center because it contains two methyl groups. These two groups are the same. This carbon is not a stereogenic center either because it contains two hydrogen atoms. This carbon is not sp3 hybridized. This carbon right here might be a stereogenic center, so let's analyze it. So this carbon is connected to a carbonyl. This carbon is connected to this entire thing right here. This carbon is also connected to this right here, which is different. And then this carbon is also connected to a hydrogen atom. And so those are four different groups. Therefore, this carbon is a stereogenic center. All right, what about the next carbon here? This is not a stereogenic carbon because it contains two hydrogen atoms. This carbon is a stereogenic center because it's bonded to a hydroxy and then bonded to this whole thing bonded to this other whole thing and a hydrogen atom so those are again four different groups and therefore this is a stereogenic carbon all right what about the next carbon here so this carbon is bonded to an amine group bonded to this entire thing and yes this is also a stereogenic center this carbon contains two hydrogen atoms and so not a stereogenic center. What about this one? This one is also stereogenic center because it's bonded to this um, isopropyl group right here, bonded to this entire thing here and here, and then it contains a hydrogen as well. And so this is definitely a stereogenic center. And then this one is not. None of the carbon, none of the carbons here is a stereogenic center. And that's pretty much it. So we have four stereogenic centers total in Alaskirin. So now let's focus more on enantiomers. Again, enantiomers are a class of stereoisomers. They are chiral molecules. Enantiomers are non-superimposable mirror images. And so any molecule with one stereogenic center will always exist as a pair of enantiomers, a pair of chiral molecules. One perfect example that we have here is secbutanol, also known as 2-butanol. Right? So when you look at the carbon here, you can see that it's a chiral carbon. It's a stereogenic center because it contains four different groups. You have a methyl group, a ethyl group, hydroxy group, and a hydrogen. And so because it contains one stereogenic center, it's mirror image will also contain a stereogenic center and these two molecules here these two structures a and b are non-superimposable mirror images therefore they are considered enantiomers they are chiral molecules so how exactly do we draw enantiomers remember enantiomers always come in a pair of chiral compounds right and so I'm going to show you two different methods on how to draw enantiomers here. Um, an example that we have is 2-butanol, right? also known as sec-butanol. So the very first step here is to draw the molecule itself. So I've drawn the molecule right here. We have the molecule, the structure, and, and then find the stereogenic center, the stereogenic or chiral 
carbon. And once you've determined the stereogenic center, then you know for sure that it's a chiral compound. And so here it is. And then all you have to do now is to draw its mirror image. And once you've drawn the mirror image, then you have your pair of enantiomers. So A and B here are a pair of enantiomers. They're both chiral compounds. So another easy way to draw a pair of enantiomers is shown here. So all you have to do is follow these steps. So again, the very first thing that you want to do is to draw the molecule itself. All right, so once you've drawn the molecule, the structure of the molecule, then locate the stereogenic center. So in this molecule, this carbon right here is the chiral carbon or stereogenic center because it contains four different groups. You have a halo group, bromine. You have a hydrogen group. You have an ethyl group right here and a propyl group. So four different groups makes this carbon chiral and it makes this molecule chiral. And so once you've identified the stereogenic center, then all you have to do now is switch the front and back groups. So you have your front group right here and the back group, right? So um, a dash wedge means that it's in the back and a normal wedge means it's at the front. And so all you have to do now is switch them. So the bromine will now be the back group and the hydrogen will now, will now be the front group as shown here. So these, these two structures right here are a pair of enantiomers. So here's an example. Draw the enantiomer for this compound. So we have L-DOPA, which is an amino acid. And so let me show you the two methods, both methods here, on drawing the enantiomer for this compound. So the very first um, method that I showed you was drawing the uh, mirror image, right? But you got to find the uh, chiral center first, the stereogenic center, just to make sure that this is a chiral compound. So when you look at this, when you look at this carbon right here that's connected to this amino group, you can see that this carbon is a chiral carbon. It is a stereogen stereogenic center. It has four different groups. You have the carboxylic acid group right here. You have the amino group. You have the rest of the molecule right here. And it's also bonded to a hydrogen atom. And so you have four different groups, which again makes this carbon a stereogenic carbon. And so I'm going to go ahead and just circle this to indicate that it is a stereogenic center. All right. And then for the first method, all you have to do is to draw a mirror image. So let's say that this is a mirror right here. And to draw the mirror image, I'm going to draw a hydrogen here, an oxygen, a bond, carbon, Okay, a bond and then a carbonyl. And then the amino group right here. And then the rest of the molecule. All right, so this right here is an enantiomer, right? So these two are a pair of enantiomers. And so that's the first method. Another method is to basically just locate the stereogenic center. And then we know that um, this carbon right here also has a hydrogen. And that hydrogen is oriented at the back. So it's going to be a back group, right? So we can draw. So I'm just going to remove this uh, red here so that you can see uh, that hydrogen. So I'm going to draw the hydrogen here, which is at the back. And all you have to do is switch the two. All right. So now the hydrogen that was originally at the back will now be at the front. And then the amine group will now be at the back. So again, we can draw it using the second method. So we have the uh, cyclic ring here alright so now we have 
the hydrogen at the front and then the amino at the back the amine group NH3 oops NH2 there we go so again these two right here are a pair of enantiomers these two right here are also a pair of enantiomers right and these two of course are the same identical molecule and so when you rotate it it will look like this basically all right so when you ro rotate this uh, 180 degree this way then it will exactly look identical to this molecule right here so stereogenic centers or chiral centers can also exist in cyclic compounds compounds containing rings right closed loop of carbon atoms that are bonded together stereogenic centers may also occur at carbon atoms that are part of a ring in order to find the stereogenic centers on ring carbons always draw the rings as flat polygons instead of using cherry conformations please don't use cherry conformations on this and then look for tetrahedral carbons okay tetrahedral sp3 hybridized carbons that are bonded to four different groups so you're trying to identify whether that sp3 hybridized carbon is a stereogenic center or a chiral center so let's look at an example here so here's the structure of methyl cyclopentane so how do we determine whether this is a chiral compound well first you got to identify if we have a stereogenic center so here's the ring and here's a methyl group connected to this carbon labeled one so is this a stereogenic center right here well you have to compare the groups and identify if we have four different groups so these two groups right here labeled in blue are actually two identical groups because they are equidistant from c1 so they are considered identical groups and so in that case we don't have a stereogenic center because two of the groups are similar and here's another example we have three methyl cyclohexene right you can see that this carbon right here that's labeled three is a stereogenic center because when you compare the the two groups right here right the one that's labeled blue and red these two are two different groups because one contains a double bond and the other carbon doesn't and so in that case all these three group uh, four groups right here are completely different and therefore this carbon labeled number three is a stereogenic carbon it's a chiral carbon and therefore this molecule itself is a chiral compound so once you've identified that a compound is a chiral compound then you can use the two methods that i showed you earlier to draw the pair of enantiomers right so one of the methods is by using a mirror image so you've identified that this carbon right here is a stereogenic center and then all you have to do now is draw its mirror image and voila you have uh, the pair of enantiomers so here's thalidomide which is a biologically active molecule that was once prescribed as an anti-nausea medicine and you can see that based on its structure it contains a stereogenic center it has a chiral center and because of that it makes this molecule a chiral compound and any chiral compound containing one stereogenic center always comes as a pair of enantiomers and so it has a mirror image and as it turns out its mirror image is a teratogen and teratogens are molecules biologically active molecules that cause birth defects in children born to women who took the medicine and here's a few more examples of biologically active molecules we have sucrose which is stable sugar containing nine stereogenic centers and the second one here is paclitaxel which is an anti-cancer agent containing 11 stereogenic centers here's an example draw the enantiomer of zanamivir and zanamivir is a medicine used to treat and prevent influenza so here's the structure of zanamivir 
and uh, the chiral centers, the stereogenic centers, are already labeled for you. So all you have to do now is to draw the enantiomer. Again, there are two different ways to draw the enantiomer. Uh, the first one is to use the mirror image, and the second one is to switch the groups, right, the back and the front groups. And so uh, since the stereogenic centers have already been uh, identified for us, all you have to do now is to switch the groups. That would be the easiest way. So let's let's do that. So here I've drawn everything else except for the orientation of the bonds for these specific uh, chiral centers here, stereogenic centers. So all we have to do now is basically switch the front and the back groups. So the first one here is a hydroxy group and you can see that this is um, oriented at the back. And so all you have to do now is flip this. So we're going to turn this into a front group using a normal wedge. All right, so that's the first one. And then here we have another hydroxy group, right? Hydroxy group that's at the front. So we're going to turn this and put it at the back using a dash wedge. And we'll do the same thing for this hydrogen right here. It's going to be a dash wedge. All right, and then we have an amine group here, and we're going to put this at the back with a dash wedge. And then this dash wedge will turn into a normal wedge. All right, and that's it. So this is uh, the mirror image or the enantiomer or the pair of enantiomers for zanamivir. And here's another example. Locate the stereogenic centers in each compound. So we have cholesterol and simvastatin. So let's take a look at cholesterol first. So we're going to try to analyze every single carbon atom here and identify the chiral carbon or the stereogenic carbon. So let's take a look at this first one right here. We have a carbon connected to a hydroxy, a hydroxy group. And then we have two carbon atoms right here that looks identical, but they're not because this carbon is bonded to a carbon with a double bond, whereas this carbon is bonded to a carbon that has a single bond. And so this right here is a chiral carbon, so we can circle it. So that's one. And then let's keep moving. So what about this carbon right here? It has a methyl group. And then uh, this carbon is bonded to uh, this carbon atom and this carbon atom right here and so we can just compare every single carbon here and so this is also a chiral center because of the fact that this group right here is different from this group all four groups are different and so this is a chiral center all right let's keep moving um, this is a double bond so it has to be an sp3 hybridized carbon and so let's take a look at this one right here. So it's connected to a hydrogen, connected to, uh, looks like these are different groups as well. So this is going to be a chiral center. And this carbon right here will also be a chiral center because it contains one hydrogen and then different types of carbon groups right here. And so that's going to be a chiral center. This will also be a different chiral center. Same thing over here. Here. And when you take a look at this one, this, uh, this carbon right here is bonded to a methyl group. And there's actually also a hydrogen that's bonded to this carbon. And this group is different from this group. And so this will also be a chiral carbon. And then everything else will be non or a chiral carbon, not a stereogenic center. So that's it. So cholesterol has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight chiral centers. All right, what about simvastatin? So let's take a look. I'm going to start with, with this carbon right over here because it contains a hydroxy group. So we have a carbon bonded to a hydroxy group, and then this carbon might be similar to this carbon but let's take a look so this carbon is bonded to 
a carbonyl and then this carbon is bonded to something else and so again there's also a hydrogen that's bonded to this carbon which makes this carbon a chiral carbon so that's one and then let's move on here so this contains two carbon two hydrogen atoms so not going to be a chiral center this might be a chiral carbon let's let's take a look so you have a carbon atom that's bonded to uh, an oxygen carbon and then this is also bonded to a hydrogen atom and so this is going to be a chiral center chiral carbon this carbon right here is not a chiral center because it contains two hydrogen atoms same thing with this one this contains a uh, a pair of hydrogen atoms this carbon is a chiral center because it's bonded to this group right here so that's one and then here's another group two three and then there's a hydrogen bonded to this one and so this is a chiral center what about this one right here this is also a chiral center because this group is different from this group and there's also a hydrogen that's bonded to this carbon atom so this is chiral as well and then these are sp2 hybridized carbon atoms so they're not chiral centers neither is this one because again you have a sp2 hybridized carbon this carbon right here is also chiral because you have a hydrogen and this group is different from this group or this group and so this is definitely a chiral center and then the next carbon here is also a chiral center because it's connected to a, an oxygen this carbon is different from this carbon or this group is different from this group and then this carbon is also bonded to a hydrogen atom and so you have four different groups therefore this is chiral and this carbon isn't chiral this one is a chiral carbon because again you have a methyl group uh, a hydrogen bonded to it and then this carbon this group right here is different from this group and so this is also chiral and then everything else is normal carbon